This is ThinkTech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back with the closing show of the day, but in some ways the most important show of the day because this is a how to do it show. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Tech Talks, and we're talking about, I suppose, the tech and technology involved in paying your taxes. Or, or <laughs> That's maybe, Reg Baker. Or, or maybe the very low tech way of low tech how way. it works. Yeah, how it works. <laughs> we're going to try to examine, you know, what happened in the Tax Reform Act of what, 2017? I guess it was passed in 2017. It was. And we're going to try to, you know, have people appreciate how it affects them because, you know, the IRS is, uh, it affects everybody, no question about that. And full disclosure, I don't like Trump. I don't like the Republican Congress. But I think my friend over here does like them, despite the fact that the vote for this, for Schlugan a bill, which is the last week in the year, you know, it's a special gift to Trump, uh, passed by... 58, make that 52 to 48 in the Senate, and 224 to 221 in the House. What I mean is it slid by on its fingernails, but it got passed. It's kind of like the presidential election. It just kind of slipped Same by. Same thing, Rich. <laughs> the other, and I'd like to start out with asking you, <clears throat> reform? What kind of, what is this reform? Did we need reform? What are we reforming here? You know, I'm not sure what we reformed, but I can tell you they they have been talking about reform since I was taking tax classes in college. All right, this goes back 30 years. Well, remember, they reformed in 1986. There was a big sweeping tax reform act in 1986. Some people say that they did. You were in college was, before 86, I, I know this. I was, and they, they, I guess that was during the Reagan era. Um, they reduced taxes, but they didn't reform them. You know, it's, it's, and I'm not sure what the definition or the difference is there, <laughs> but they said that, uh, and what they're claiming is that this is the first reform that they've had in over 30 years, uh, and it's got significant impact. Yeah. Right, so well, we'll sir, it does it have significant that. impact when you talk about that. But I'd like to, you know, uh, sort of uh, talk about the landscape for a minute. No hearings. Let me put it this way. Zippity-doo on the hearings. Nobody came to testify, nobody from business, nobody from government even, um, nobody from the community came and testify to say, I like this or I don't like this, or let me give you some advice. That's kind of extraordinary. Not a single hearing. This is all backroom legislation, right? It sounds like it, kind of like the Affordable Care Act. Yes, exactly. Yeah, very similar. This is what we got in Congress now. You know, and it's dysfunctional. Things Thank need you. to get better, you know, and so regardless of which party is in charge, Affordable Care Act or tax reform, we've got issues that need to be fixed. Well, we, do, we did, did we? I mean, reform we what? Do. You know, I'm really not <laughs> sure about that. Let's leave that open. The other thing is that uh, the press said, in, you know, in the ramp up, which was probably a month or so before it was actually passed, um, was that this is going to favor the wealthy, it was going to favor the big corporations, the multinationals, and it was going to dump on the poor. Um, and, and, and that's consistent with Trump, and it's consistent with, you know, the extremists in, in the Republican Party right now. So what's your comment on that? Is, I mean, does it achieve that? Um, uh, should we be happy about that? Uh, isn't that the real purpose of this legislation, this Reform Act? To answer the question best I can, yes, there's going to be some benefit to the wealthy, but there's also going to be a lot of benefit to the non-wealthy. I think there's uh, enough benefit flowing through the reform to benefit a lot of good cross-section of all the taxpayers in the country. And we'll have some breaks, undoubtedly, sure. and some small businesses, too, will have some breaks, although we're going to talk about how the, the rates start and the rates, you know, some of them, mm -hmm. some of them end. Um, but, you know, the other thing that strikes me is, is what happened like two days after, two days after the President uh, Trump signed this, this bill, Paul Ryan gets up to the press and he says, oh, gee whiz, looks like we're not going to have enough money now that we did all this, um, you know, tax reduction in the Reform Act. We're not going to have enough money to do the social safety net. So our big mission in 2018 is to take a look and cut Social Security, cut Medicare, 
cut Medicaid. Do you think he just had that idea, you know, after the bill was passed? Do you think he might have entertained that before? Isn't this what they refer to in the tax practice as a step transaction? Step <laughs> one, step two. We knew about step two before we did step You're one. You're saying it was a st strategic move on their part to, to set this up. I think it was an extraordinary deception. And that's not the subject of our show today. It's just laying the, the framework, the foundation for this really, really special legislation, which all of us will have to live with. Well, at least for the next seven years, because a lot of it, if most of it, will sunset on December 1st, 2026. In that period of time, we're not going to have a lot of money for building infrastructure, even walls. You know, In that I, period of time, you know, we're not going to have money to pay Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. And I think step two is going to be painful. Let me, let me just share with you that a lot of money that people are all talking about uh, is actually starting to come back into the country. Exxon today just announced $50 billion they're pulling back into the They're country. not the only one. There are others, Apple, too. Apple, $100 billion. Yeah. Microsoft, $80 billion. Yeah. There's a lot of companies out there that have offshore cash that they're bringing back into the country that that's work? going to be taxed. Why? Okay, they're bringing it back. This is really an important point. It's been in the newspapers, and there's, you know, virtually hundreds of billions of dollars are being repatriated. So the first question is, you know, what mechanism in the Tax Reform Act causes these companies to say, oh, okay, we're going to repatriate right away in a matter of days? And how do they benefit by this? How do how does the country benefit by this? Well, let me, let me try to answer that with two, part A and part B. But let me also say that Roger Epstein is probably a better person to answer that because <laughs> he's got more experience in that international area. But over the years, companies have set up operations offshore. Uh, and I can show you graphs where the U.S. tax rate was like here, similar to all the international tax rates. International tax rates started to drop, and they came way down. U.S. didn't change. It stayed pretty much constant. So, of course, people are going to be going offshore to take advantage of lower tax rates. Uh, what happened with this reform is that now, at 21 percent, the U.S. rates are down below all the international From 39 rates. to 21, that's a chop of it's a huge uh, drop. About half right off. So right now, all of a sudden, the whole dynamics of that has flip-flopped. Now, all of a sudden, the international uh, income tax rates are higher than the U.S. tax rates. That's number one. So everybody's reevaluating their operations right now, thinking that it might make sense to move back. Now, as you probably know, a lot of countries have treaties, tax treaties, with the U.S. And there's, you know, in the details of the returns, you get credits to apply it against uh, foreign taxes paid to offset domestic taxes. So it usually a one-for-one -one credit for those countries that have treaties. Now, if there are countries out there that don't have that treaty, or if, for example, Ireland, they say set up operations over here, you don't have to pay taxes for 15 years. Well, those taxes, that, though that income is going to accumulate and not be taxed. And they don't want to bring it back because there's no tax treaty offset to, you know, the, the taxes paid. There's nothing there to offset the taxes that are due. So they just leave it offshore. Now, all of a sudden, they're saying any cash or cash equivalents you've got offshore that you have not brought back, now we want you to pay just 15% on that. Not 21. Special one-time rate, 15%. Amnesty. And yeah. so that's where all these literally hundreds of billions of dollars are going to start coming back into the U.S., taking advantage of that special low rate to do so. so and in fact, Ireland is suffering. American investment in Ireland yeah. is, is shrinking while you watch. They're concerned. Well, the whole dynamics of international, at least from an American perspective, and even from foreign perspective, I mean, they, rather than, if they might find it more tax efficient to have operations over here you know, and take advantage of the 21% tax rate here opposed to the higher rates that they might have offshore. Yeah. So everything is being reevaluated and rebalanced right but help, now. Help me with the mechanics of it. So I, I'm a, a multinational and I have $100 billion over there somewhere, Ireland or elsewhere. And uh, I, I see the Trump uh, Reform Act and I say, well, I'm gonna move it back. I'm gonna move it back. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get them to cable me 
$100 billion and I'm going to put it in the bank in Manhattan. I'm going to do that. And now, why is that a benefit to me? Why, why is that going to help me to simply move the money back to my bank in, in America? So you can put it to use in the U.S. To They're, invest it. Build factories, hire people. I mean, look at what's happening with all the bonuses that are going out, all the raises that are happening. A lot of company, very early, a lot of companies were automatically taking advantage of that. Now, we're only a month into this, sort of. And there's a lot of research. There's a lot of mechanics that have to be figured out. The logistics on this, still, they're still trying to figure out how all of this is going to work. So to get real specific is going to be difficult because there are no rules or regulations yeah, written yet. Yeah. Some of this is pie in the sky. I mean, I mean for example, the market today, and, and I think there's got to be a connection uh, between the fact that the market went down 400 points, okay, and Trump is giving a speech. Even as we speak, he's speaking. Oh, I'm so interested. Maybe we'll take a break in the middle of the show and listen to the speech. <laughs> but anyway, so but I still, I'd like to, you know, just catch this one thing. So I move my $100 billion back. Um, and, and presumably now as a multinational, I would invest that into new business enterprises here in the United States. And I would, hopefully I would earn a profit on that on those new business enterprises. Is that what it is? I bring my investment, because just bringing the money back doesn't do anything. No, you're right. If it just sits there and they don't do anything with it, yeah. then it, it's really a, a non-event. So they it, might use it to pay down some debt, or they might use it to you know, maybe refurbish some factories. Uh, but the point is that they're, they should be using this money, and I believe the intent is that they're going to be using this money to make investments in this country, to hire more people, to bring some of the manufacturing that was put pushed offshore in the yeah, past, yeah. now they're going to bring it back. Yeah. So it requires, it requires two steps. You know, one is you got to bring it back. Two is you got to put it in, in new business ventures and earn a profit. And that's when you get the benefit. Yeah? Yes. It's the same thing with the banks. Like, you know, I saw the, the race to give bonuses in the local banks. Everybody gets $1,000 or Bizarre 15. how quickly it that just It was amazing. Spread. You know, mm -hmm. they'll follow each other. So <clears throat> that, that itself, giving that bonus, um, I guess it gives them a deduction, uh, but that's, that's not the important thing. The important thing is, I guess, what they're saying is we are going to have extra cash because we're, we're not going to pay so much taxes under this new tax reform bill. Um, and therefore, it's we're not flush. not as innocent as that. Uh, what is there's, another, the there's another the piece reason? to yeah. it. Taking a deduction, paying bonuses in 2017 is better than paying bonuses in 2018. You should get the deduction right away. The deduction's also bigger, right? Corporate because rates it's are under 35 the rate, the 39% rate. So yeah. if you pay a $100,000 bonus, you get to save 35,000 in taxes. If you did it on January 1st, $100,000 bonus, you save 21,000. Thank you. So there's there's Thank other you. motivation to yeah. do this. You mean it's not just charity and generosity to the employees, eh? No, much to to my surprise, <laughs> I guess businesses just don't do that all the time. But that's a good segue <laughs> for us to start discussing the exact provisions that we are looking at and and seeing, you know, what's going to happen and how they're going to affect us. So let me ask you about a couple of them. Um, let's see. Okay, standard deduction, serious change. Uh, how does that work? How does it affect the average taxpayer? First of all, I think we need to remember that 70% of all people in this country use the standard deduction. Only 30% itemize. So 70% of the people who file tax returns just had their standard deduction doubled. That's huge. You know, for, for an individual that's single, that's about, you know, what, 6,000? What, what does the bill say? Uh, what, how does that work, doubled? Well, I was just going to say, I think right now in 2017, a single will get about 6500 Yeah. Next year, 2018, is 13000 Doubled. And the same thing with the married filing joint. It went from about 12000 to 24000 So if that's the case, I don't, I don't need, most people don't need individual uh, they, itemized deductions. Exactly. Huh? They, they won't need it. They didn't take it before. Right. They're certainly not going to take it now. they're in great shape. Right. So that's, that's huge. And that's where they're coming up and saying that, you know, the projections are that's going to save an average family a couple thousand dollars a year in taxes. And indeed. Well, the average savings around the country, I think it's $800. $800. Per person. Per person. Okay. Well, that's, yeah. that's big savings. 
But that doesn't last forever. That we talked before. Um, that lasted 2015, which is uh, the what the end of. Um, what, what, what is the significance of 2015? Uh, well, it's 2025. I'm sorry, 25. You know, I'm so. 10 years behind. <laughs> 2025. Thank so. you for your kindness, Rick. <laughs> 2025, it all reverts back. January 1st, 2026, everything resets. Yeah. Back to where it was in 2017. Yeah. Unless things change between now and then. And Meaning I can guarantee. Further acts of Congress. Well, and we know that they're going to be putting their fingers in there. They're going to be doing things. Change will come. But until that happens, everything resets uh, January 1st, 2000. Resets, goes back to the way it was. So yes. all, all this is a kind of patina, a gloss all on what happened before, and it disappears 2020, 2025. Right. But that's not so for the corporate reduction from 39% on what, a net profit, I the, guess, the net income, yep. uh, to uh, 21%, 21%, a huge cut in half. That is permanent, right? Permanent as of today. As of today. But as of today, it's permanent. Yes. The other one is temporary as of today. So my question for you, and I know you have no answer. But I'm going well, to ask my question. Then anyway. I'll do the best I can do to the best not you answer. Can. <laughs> why, why is the corporate reduction permanent while the individual human person um, not permanent? What's the justification? Well, my non-answer to that is I don't know. <laughs> It's a political, you know how sausage is made. You've seen the process. Everything is negotiated. This bill had 500 pages, and it's filled with red marginal notations and strikeouts. Everything was negotiated in the last week before that bill passed. Why things happened, I don't think anybody they knows. They should have had hearings. They should have done it in a, you know, in a more orderly fashion, but they were in a big hurry. I think they were afraid they wouldn't be able to do it anymore if they waited. So, um, you know, I think uh, this is going to be um, a kind of um, a retirement fund for accountants, and it's going to be a <laughs> <laughs> and maybe tax lawyers too, and it's going to be a major problem for the Internal Revenue Service. Can you, do you agree with that? I do, if it doesn't kill the accountants and the tax <laughs> attorneys. Uh, the stress that this has created has been somewhat significant. Now, I don't want to hear a lot of violins and teardrops, <laughs> but um, on top of what is normally a very busy time of the year, we're also having to deal with tax reform, which is confusing a lot of people. What applies? What doesn't apply? Can I prepay this and not prepay sure, that? Sure, we saw and, that with the say tax returns, you know, the, the property tax issue at the end of the year. Yeah. Yeah. And on top of this, when the first estimated tax payment is due April 15th. So in addition to 2017 taxes, we have to try to figure out everything that's going on with 2018 so we can make fairly accurate estimated tax payments in April 15th. Yeah, the Internal Revenue Service has to revise its schedules, its forms, the first one of which is due the, the monthly uh, what, withholding tax form. Um, that's, that's due in a couple of days, no? Actually, yeah, they've just issued the new payroll tax tables that incorporate some of these things, like the new standard deduction. And one thing we didn't talk about, the exemptions. Yeah, let's are, talk about the gone. exemptions. Yeah. You know, they're so gone. They're gone. Wait a minute. What about, you know, kids and people living with you and all that? That's been in the law since 1954. Gone. Gone. My goodness. Yeah. Well, if you have the big uh, standard deduction, I guess that it, offsets, it's, it yeah. offsets that. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of trade-offs in this kind of thing. For example, we talked before about the 20% um, you know, reduction in the, in the small business, what, gross income. Can you talk about how that yeah. works? QBI, Qualified Business Income. Uh, that's Section 199. You're going to hear a lot about QBI. 199A, wasn't it? Yes. Thank you. Excuse me. 199A. <laughs> um, there is no B. <laughs> but but uh, just as an example, and there's flowcharts that are pretty sophisticated in how this all works. Um, there's maybe 10 or 15 boxes on these flowcharts, you know, with yes and no decision points. Uh, but in very simplistic terms, if you've got $100,000 income in a flow-through entity, 20% of it you can deduct off of that $100,000. So the $100,000 less 20%, you get a $20,000 deduction. You pay taxes on $80,000. That, very simplistically, is how it's supposed to work. What? Why? What, what, all of a sudden, why? This never existed in the law before. Why now? 
there's official and unofficial reasons. Um, I think the official reason is it's an attempt to try to bring parity back to some of the, the, the flow through business entities with the corporate structure because some of the things that the corporations can deduct and take advantage of are not allowed at a, a flow through entity level. For example, owner, medical insurance, um, you know, certain uh, expenses related to uh, FICA taxes, employment taxes, you can only deduct half of it, whereas a corporation deduct the whole thing. So there's an attempt to try to bring some parity uh, between the different entities. Yeah, parity. Now, but, but in fact, I mean, you know, what, what you get at the, at, the, at the core of this is that although corporate rates on a C corporation, uh, you know, a formal corporation, are being reduced by, by half, there is no such rate reduction for others. And this is a way, right? This is a way to achieve parity, I there guess, uh, attempt, with the yeah. fact that there's no rate reduction for others. Now, there are, there are two. Those flow-throughs go to the individual return, right? Page one, schedule, you know, schedule C or schedule E, wherever it ends up, and then gets taxed in the, the 1040, the regular tax return. Now, the tax tables have all changed tax rates have come down and the for individual people yes ah and within but not as much as half not though. as much but there's two ways that they're saving money number one the rates have come down a lot so if, if you've seen the, the tables you know there's a 39 percent for this much and then a, a 37 percent for this much and so forth all the way down to zero the brackets have expanded and the rates have dropped. So what's happening is uh, for the 200, so let's just say for people making less than 200,000, the rates have dropped by about 10 or 15 percent, plus the brackets have really widened. So you can make a whole lot more money before you jump to the next, what they call marginal tax rate. And so it's a combination of those two things that's going to save the individual's taxes. How much? You know, we got to figure that out when yeah. we do the tax return. Yeah, yeah, and that's all temporary too until 2025. Yeah. yeah, boy, this is going to be an interesting ramp up into it, and then a ramp up out of it, and maybe changes in the middle too. My guess is that there will be changes in the middle. My guess also is that some of this will become permanent. Which ones? How much? I guess depends, depends upon on the, who the political wins in the November elections. So. So, I mean, there's the November elections, there's the next presidential election, there's a lot that can happen in the next seven years that, that will have an impact on this one way or another. That's, a, that's the trouble, that everything is in play. The only thing that's really certain is that it went from 39 to 21% for the big corporations, that's certain. Yes. The rest of it, you really can't figure out what's gonna be, except that it's gonna be more complicated, not less complicated. And I, you know, I, 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 when, I, when I hear the word tax reform, I hear simplification, but it's not simplification at all. It's, it's complexifying, isn't it? Uh, well, I'm not sure what that word is, but it, it is more complicated. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, one, another anomaly in this that I find fascinating and I think unfair uh, to a lot of people is the uh, estate tax exemptions that have doubled. You know, they were roughly 5.2 million now all of a sudden they're up or 5.6 million. Now all of a sudden they're 11.2 million, which means anybody who has an estate that passes away this year, 2018, um, will have an exemption of $11.2 million that there's no tax on. Uh, we, and that means between husband and wife? Each. Each, so it's 22 million for husband and wife. If they do it right. Now what's interesting, and, and this is where strategy comes in and estate planning, and that's not what we're going to really talk about here today but for example my wife and I if I had 10 million she had 10 million I can pass mine on to her no problem but then when she passes she's only got that 11 million dollars to play with or I can take my 10 million give it to my kids and she can do the same and that and means 22 million yes. Is so you got to think ahead on how best to do this. It's not always the most efficient way to just give everything to the surviving spouse. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, sh short of a little planning, this sounds like it favors the wealthy, uh, and it means uh, that they get a, a break that's roughly twice what it was before, 
and it's consistent with the, the, the claim that has been made over the past few months that this bill favors the wealthy. It puts more money in their hands. It well, lets them let's accumulate just wealth. say that that one part of it does. I don't think we can paint the entire Reform Act with one brush. Oh, oh, I can. I, I can. You, you, you don't have to. And you usually You're an accountant, do, but. but I can. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there are parts that, yes, favor one group over another, but not uniformly. I mean, there are benefits in there. I mean, let's face it. 67% um, of all taxes are paid by the top 10%. You know, so when you have tax reform and you have tax savings, yeah, the people, the 10% of the population that pay 60-something percent of all the taxes are going to get a little bit more well, benefit than the bottom. There's an enormous reduction in the amount of taxes that are going to be, that are going to be paid under this, under this Reform Act. And, and the, one problem that Roger uh, Epstein m mentioned when we spoke more than once uh, was that this, this is a, a formula for inflation. If you have more money, you know, fed into the economy, like all those bonuses and everything, all of a sudden you goose the, the amount of available cash, disposable cash, uh, and you have the risk of inflation. And but, what's the solution to that is you increase the interest rates, which is what the Fed's been doing. So in anticipation of some of that, they've been clicking up that interest rate, uh, and they just have continued to announce that they're going to continue to do that. Yeah, well, they should. I mean, really, it's been embarrassingly low for a long time. And you wonder how, how business can go if they can't charge. But speaking of interest, what about the deductibility of interest? Is it, is it relevant anymore now that we have a doubling of the uh, standard deduction? For a lot of people, no. Some people, yes. You know, for those states that have high property values, for people who have mortgages in excess of seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, a lot of people it becomes do. relevant. I mean, well, not, not as many, many as you think. Not that many people no. in Hawaii. No, that's not the, the the value of their home may be high, yes, but not the mortgage because the banks wouldn't give them that much. Correct. And I, I, I remember reading somewhere, and I can't quote where, but I, but it's only like six percent, seven percent of new mortgages this past year was in excess of $750,000. Yeah. It's not that big a part of the... Uh, so is it deductible anymore? What's the change? It's deductible. Up the interest on $750,000 yeah. is deductible. Up, up past that, it's not deductible. So if you've got an $800,000 mortgage, the interest piece on that $50,000, you can't deduct. Okay. And, and you would only do that if it exceeded the standard deduction, which has been increased right. to 13000 and change. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so what about uh, charitable deductions? How are they doing? You know, the, the charities are making a lot of noise. Um, they feel that because the standard deduction has shot way up, there's going to be a lot of people that are not going to be making their contributions like they have before because there's no tax advantage to do that. Now, what's happening is you're going to see a lot of new ways of making these contributions um, where they call it donor-advised funds and, and different ways that people can bunch up their contributions. So every other year, for example, let's just say one year they take the standard deduction, the next year they bunch all their other deductions up and take it all in one year, so then they'll take the deduction next year might be higher than that standard. Yeah. So they're trying to figure out ways to, to, to you know, continue but, making the charitable contribution. But it is deductible in full. Yes. Uh, still, uh, but only if you are exceeding, you know, you're not electing right. the uh, standard deduction. If I was making, if I had mortgage interest and property taxes and charitable contributions, and if all of that stuff added up to less than $24,000, I'd take the twenty-four thousand sure. dollars. Doesn't mean I can't be making those payments. I no. can still make those payments. Sure. But instead of deducting them individually, well, I'm it, getting the twenty-four thousand. It simplifies it. So I, I, I think you know there, there is some concern, but I think only time will tell how uh, big a concern that tends. Yeah, ends up and to I be. agree with you that there'll have to be changes in the meantime because to go back to the way it was after having the simplicity, if you will, of a larger standard deduction, going to be hard to do that. Um, okay, one, one great big one. Oh, oh, yeah, the Johnson Amendment. I don't know if you're familiar with the Johnson Amendment. The Johnson yeah, Amendment was part of the 54 Code. Uh, the Johnson Amendment said... I wasn't said, around that. <laughs> <laughs> you were busy. The Johnson Amendment said that, you know, a, a charity uh, to retain its exemption as a nonprofit 
uh, could not give money to, to political candidates or campaigns. Uh, yeah. Okay, and uh, your president, uh, Donald Trump, has been trying Our to... Our president. Uh, okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here. <laughs> Um, has been trying to pull, pull the Johnson Amendment and make it possible for charitable deductions uh, to give money to campaigns and, and, and candidates. This is sort of like Citizens United for, for, uh, uh, for nonprofits. And, and the problem with that is it's blind. So I give money, deductible money, mm -hmm. to a charity, and then the charity decides it wants to you know, support a given Republican candidate, for example. Um, well, I don't have control. I'm the contributor, but I have no control. And uh, the result is that these large mega charities, mega churches, mm. especially in the South, can give enormous amounts of money and, again, you know, pervert the political process. Did he get that through? Is that part of the tax reform act? No, not that I'm aware of. But it is 500 pages. There could be something in there on there. But I kind of see it as a non-event because people could always go to Canada and set these things up just like the Clintons did. They got the Clinton Foundation up there that's, that's doing all of this on a worldwide basis, including the U.S., and it's outside the purview of the U.S. rules and regulations. So, you know, Canada is pretty friendly to that. Now, the question is whether I get a deduction, assuming I'm outside the standard deduction, whether I get the deduction for giving uh, to a, a, a charity that's going to be winding, that's going to be, you know, passing my money to a political campaign. Usually, from my understanding of the nonprofit charitable process, is that if anybody's involved in lobbying efforts, they lose that charitable classification. And anything that you contribute to them is not deductible. Now, a couple other interesting things that's related is, number one, lobbying expenses are no longer deductible by anybody. Entertainment expenses are no longer deductible by anybody. Uh, and, you know, those miscellaneous deductions that you have on your Schedule A, the 2%, um, you know, safety deposit box, investment, that kind of stuff, employee expenses, all gone. Interesting. Boy, that's, that's a bath of cold water, isn't it? It is. That's kind of disappointing because there are individuals that, that the Form 2106, if you're familiar with that, is an employee, a non-reimbursable employee expense. Um, and there are a lot of companies out there that require you to drive your car to different places, have meetings with different people. You used to be able to deduct that, and now that's all gone. What are you going to do in, in the past, uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, in tax season? You have to fill out that form and advise this, this uh, taxpayer uh, about what lunch he could take and what lunch he couldn't take. You, you'll have nothing to do anymore, Reg. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's going to be an interesting process educating the taxpayer on all of these changes. Because, you know, and as, as you pointed out, there was an awful lot of noise leading up to this and a lot of negotiation, a lot of twists and turns. Within Congress, and, not with the public, but within Congress. Well, but that was getting out, and people were talking about it, and now all of a sudden they got the final bill, and now what we've got to do is make sure that we understand this is the final bill, and all this noise that you heard yeah, before... You're right about that. You know, it's just noise. One last uh, provision we ought to talk about is the deductibility of, of state taxes for federal purposes, and that would include income taxes we pay to the state of Hawaii, which are 11% right now uh, at a max, uh, and also real property taxes. Um, so until this point, we could deduct that uh, for the Fed, um, and that's, that's not the case anymore. There's a limitation now, right? $10,000. And I have not seen any studies that indicate how much uh, or how many taxpayers in Hawaii exceed the $10,000. For example, um, I've seen a lot of people deduct four or $5,000 in property taxes, and I've seen people deduct another four or $5,000, you know, or less in income taxes or sales tax. They get that option. All right, so these numbers have to, if, as long as they're under 10,000, the impact is zip, nothing. Fact is the state is in f fiscal trouble. We don't have the money to pay for unliquidated liabilities and liquidated liabilities. Some people think we're $40 billion in the hole. Certainly, we haven't paid for the employee's retirement system And that's before the rail. And Right, and the rail. <laughs> May I add, the rail. So what, what that means to me is we are, and so many other things too, you know, climate change things, we are going to have to spend much more money at the state, at the state and county level in order to keep up with things. It's going to have to happen. However unpleasant that may be to people running for office, um, the, the result then is that it's likely that our taxes, both income taxes and county real property taxes, is going to go up 
and exceeding the $10,000. We're going to be hurt, aren't we? It's, it's possible, yes. It's a double whammy. We pay more, but we can't deduct it. Yeah. Well, and the other piece of this, and again, we have to wait and see how it all flows through, but our tax program or how we tax our income here in Hawaii is all based off the adjusted gross income of the federal return. So if the federal return adjusted gross income uh, goes down because of standard deductions and some other things that might be flowing through, then that's going to help lower our taxable income here too. So you know, again, we got to wait and see how all of this flows sure. through the system. There's sure. a lot of it's a matrix. A lot of different uh, decision points have to be made. Um, you know, it, it's not. It, it's hard to project exactly what the impact's going to well, be. I'll, but, I'll, but can I make one one sure, comment? Sure, sure. Well, face camera one. <laughs> My comment is that if we are constantly spending more and more and more, and we're exceeding the revenues that we're able to generate within the state. At some point, we got to take a look and see if there's a place that maybe we can tighten the belt just a little bit. If I was constantly overspending my income, I'd have to cut back somewhere. Most businesses will do the same thing. I know the state government is not a business, but they need to at least consider cutting back in some areas that may have some excess. We should all vote accordingly on that issue. I think I agree with you, and it's very important. But one last point. And that is in the state legislature, as every year, there is a conformity bill because there are little changes in the, in the IR, uh, Internal Revenue Code every year. And, um, and this is a whole bunch of big changes. So the same bill, it's two pages long, has been submitted to conform the state, uh, the state tax code with the changes in the federal code. And it will undoubtedly pass. It does every year. It does every year. There's no reason it wouldn't this year. It's just it's a softer, you know, easier approach for them instead of, you know, getting into the detail. So, you know, I'm not sure how this works, um, but I would, I would ask you this question. So um, assuming uh, we, we pay more in taxes here um, and maybe the rates will go up too, okay, in taxes here, we're, we're going to... We're going to wind up having a greater state and county tax bill, but we won't be able to deduct more than the $10,000. Um, how does that work uh, when, you, when you feed them together, when you conform and, and then, you know, you, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, you know, and, and again, there's going to be a lot of confusion about how all this is going to work. The, the, the instructions aren't written yet. Um, you know, the, the flow through to the state, uh, there may be a cap on how much can be deducted uh, at the federal level, but that doesn't necessarily impact what can be deducted here at the state level. Right. You know, so, you know, there's, there can be exceptions. For example, one of the exceptions that is not part of the conformity bill every year is the Section 179 deduction, which is a special deduction that you can write, you know, assets off immediately instead of over a period right, of years. Right, accelerate depreciation. Yes. That doesn't, that's not part of the conformity bill that's always been a, an exemption they can do the same thing with other areas so there, there could be changes made at the state level that would help uh, the local residents here and, and not have them maybe get slammed as much I th think what's happening is that the federal tax bill will probably drop for most residents the state tax bill might go up but they can be fixed locally yeah right well, okay but but the state tax bill will go up and we can't deduct it for the federal so I mean it, but the offset to the federal might be higher than the increase at the state yeah if that makes sense I mean if yeah. we're saving say five thousand dollar family of three you're saving five or six thousand dollars at the federal level but the state tax bill goes up by a thousand yeah or two yeah you're still coming out ahead yeah well that may be so but if Social Security is, is re reduced or Medicare or Medicaid is reduced it's going to look small potatoes to the elder people who are losing their livelihoods as, as, as it were. I don't think that'll ever happen and if it ever does I'm sure there's gonna be a grandfathering of process that this takes place. I mean everything that I have seen that would indicate any possibility of passage is gonna be extending the retirement date 
and increasing the brackets where the Social Security uh, tax and Medicare tax have to be paid. So just like they took away the cap on Medicare, they'll probably take away the cap on Social Security at some point. They're going to say you can't retire until you're 68 or 69. You know, it's those, already on the way. Those two things will, will right the ship as far as Social Security is concerned. They, you don't have to cut the benefits to do that. You you're, just, you're a terrific optimist. All things will be right. Well, but it's also and Congress is wiser than we think. Do you think it's politically possible for any group to go through and cut Social Security? You know, tax? you know, I would have, you know, a year or two years ago, I would have said no, not possible. Now, um, open season. Maybe I mean, anything could happen. Baby boomers are getting older. They're getting into that group. I hope they that block again. is getting bigger and bigger. And which I wanted to ask you one other thing about health care. Ah. Buried in that bill somewhere is the end of the, what do you call it, the individual mandate. The mandate. That, that was tricky. That was, you know, that really didn't have a whole lot to do with tax. It was health care. It was what he wanted. And he slipped it in and slipped it to the American public who, the young people who don't want to get uh, health insurance, who are going to get sick, and that's going to wind up being a burden on the rest of us. Is that a good idea, Reg? I'm not going to answer whether it's a good idea or not, but let me just illustrate one point. That mandate where the penalty might be, say, let's just round number, $695. If you don't have insurance, you got to pay $695. All right. Now, if I was a young person and I don't get sick, I mean, how many times in your 20s did you really ever have to go to the doctors about anything? Rarely. So would I want to spend $600 a month all year long, $7,200 a year for medical insurance, or would I rather just pay that penalty of six or $700? Yeah, and if you get sick, well, you go to the hospital and they send you a bill for $100,000, and then you call mom. <laughs> or you just go to the emergency room like all the homeless do, and they get it for free. And we wind up paying for it. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> Reg, it's been wonderful to have this discussion. It's long in coming, this discussion. And it's so nice to be able to talk to somebody with whom I agree on so little. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we get along so well, Jay. <laughs> Thank you, Reg Baker. <laughs> Reg Baker, accountant par excellence. We'll do it again. All right, looking forward to it. Thanks.